for today will be Lisa Guillaume, and she is the Director of sorry, Strategic Initiatives for United Against Human Trafficking. What starts here changes the world. Nisha internalized this motto from her alma mater and believes that individual efforts create a collective impact against human trafficking and social justice issues. With her eye on the future, Nisha plans and strategizes projects against, um, <clears throat> sorry, strategizes projects that propel UAHP's mission and vision into tomorrow. Aside from her dedication to UAHP, Nisha delights in sharing with others on Houston's cultural diverse, uh, sorry, culturally diverse food scene and fair trade food and clothing. So, Misa, if you would, wouldn't mind uh, taking over and sharing with us on this topic of human trafficking. Sure. Thank you so very much. Um, good evening, everyone. I'm in Central Time, so it's getting dark out here. Um, so don't worry, worry the light changes behind me, but thank you so much for joining on the call. I'm really excited to share what we've been doing at United Against Human Trafficking for some years now and uh, my personal journey in all of this and in, in really getting um, invested in, in fair trade and ethically sourced goods. Um, so let me start with the organization. So I work for United Against Human Trafficking and we are a local 501c3 nonprofit that specializes in ending the issue through education awareness and outreach. Uh, we've been doing this for at least about 12, 13 years now, and I've been, been with the agency for 10 years, um, and primarily my role has been with education. So it's been a journey for our organization to uh, come to this point today where we are a coordinator of Fair Trade Houston. So I'll be sharing a bit about how we got there, what we're doing, um, but generally I have to start with, you know, who we are, who, who are we as an organization? Uh, so as stated, our mission is as such. And as we delved into ways beyond just simply educating people about human trafficking, we started to realize, well, we need to be able to give people and help guide people in a solution against human trafficking or solutions. Um, it didn't seem like just enough for us to instruct people to teach them about what human trafficking was, uh, you know, how to respond, to call the National Human Trafficking Hotline if you see something, you know, to report it. Uh, we also said, you know, people need to be able to take a tangible action, have some buy-in so that they really invest in this movement. And as we looked around, we identified fair trade as early as, uh, I think it was around 2011, 2012, when we launched our campaign in our town. Um, and at the time, we were uh, the only, I think, or we would be, the biggest and only fair trade town of our size um, if we had finished our campaign, you know, within a reasonable time of starting it in 2012. Well, it took us about, um, I think upwards to about 2017, 2018 to be declared an actual fair trade town. And the reason why I'm not clear on that is because we weren't uh, the, we're, we're, we weren't always the official coordinator of Bertrand Houston over those years. Um, and so honestly, it took so long <laughs> that sometimes it was, it was just a, a, a worthy endeavor just to make sure that people still knew that we were trying to do this in Houston and just to continue to bring awareness to not only human trafficking, but fair trade and fair trade Houston as a way of combating human trafficking. So fast forward many years now, um, we have been a fair trade town and we simply have a group of dedicated volunteers, uh, organizations like ourselves who are invested in spreading awareness about the issue of um, fair trade as it relates to preventing and confronting human trafficking. I think uh, having the opportunity to have this call and have this time to speak about a platform like human trafficking and how it relates to fair trade is such um, a novel idea. I didn't really realize it when I was in the middle of doing this work. So I've been on this personal journey as well, trying to figure out, okay, how can we in our daily lives make change to fight human trafficking? Um, and I've also been kind of that personal or going through that personal experience, excuse me, of how do you do that as a person? Um, and I think that's fairly difficult, you know. Um, unfortunately, it's not as easy as we would like. It's definitely gotten better. I've definitely noticed a change over many years in, in following this movement as it parallels human trafficking, you know, how many options, how many uh, brands and, you know, places you can simply just go out to a grocery store and purchase fair trade or you know, more people are using that kind of language, getting, either getting certified or using language like ethically sourced. 
um, it's really exciting to be involved and to be able to support a, a like a parallel movement like fair trade and be able to use it to combat human trafficking. Um, I do find that it's still difficult to present that idea. Um, for instance, just this weekend, we had uh, what we call a market. Uh, we actually rebranded it recently and it was called The Good Market. And at that event, we were hosting it at a coffee shop that is a, called A Second Cup in the Heights in Houston. So if you're ever in Houston, come visit A Second Cup. Um, it's a wonderful place and a coffee shop that serves up really good coffee, of course, and food and tea. And its whole mission is to actually support anti-trafficking efforts, but they also are believers and promoters of fair trade and ethically sourced goods and survivor-made goods, um, meaning survivors of human trafficking produced products. Um, and so we had the market there, but we still had to really explain to people, you know, who we are when we're united against human trafficking, but we're here to talk about fair trade and how it's a solution to prevent human trafficking. So I think a lot of times I encounter people who are interested in ethically made goods, but they, they don't make the connection readily that a movement like fair trade and ethically sourced goods can combat a crime like human trafficking. Um, so I think that's, that's part of the battle. Similarly to what we, we're facing in human trafficking in a field alone, where we're having to, you know, 20 years into this issue, uh, it's 2020, having to educate people about what human trafficking is. People recognize it, but people aren't aware of exactly what it is, what it's defined as, um, let alone how they can respond and combat it. Uh, so it's a similar kind of, I think it's a similar kind of issue where with fair trade, we have to explain what it is, but then additionally explain that, hey, this is why it's really important to you if you believe in fighting human trafficking or, you know, you just want to call it slavery and you want to eliminate slavery. Well, that's great. Here's a way that you can do that. Um, so many times, even just this morning, I was on a college campus uh, delivering some introductions to human trafficking and having to really explain that, you know, while people may be passionate about human trafficking, um, you can call the hotline number and that's great, but here's something that you can do right here and now. Um, so that's something that I try to instill in, in all the groups that we get to talk to and also we're even working in individually like within our staff of helping educate new staff members about you know this is an approach, this is a tangible means, this is something that people can do right then and there um, you know tomorrow. Um, so it's definitely a, I think this is very much an important issue to make sure that we support one another and to continue to clarify that very tangible link. Um, and if you aren't, hopefully if you're on this call, you understand the link, but perhaps I should spend a moment talking about just how simply you can do that. Um, one of the ways I try to quickly break that down is, you know, using a line like, you know, fair trade and ethically sourced goods are a way to prevent and confront or prevent and eliminate, excuse me, um, human trafficking. Because if you can, give a person a job opportunity or pay them a fair and living wage, they aren't vulnerable to the lures of a trafficker. Still working, a work in progress, quite a few words still there, but you get the idea is that you have to really um, be able to speak clearly and effectively to people so that with, when you have their attention, they focus in, they're listening, and hopefully they, they buy into the message so that it inspires them to make changes in their own lives. Um, I think another way is to really point out examples of how people can do that because, you know, they might already support you and they might be like, oh, that's great and all, but, um, you know, fair trade is really expensive or, you know, one of the many myths we all hear and know about fair trade or ethically made goods that are out there. Um, and so it's about really educating yourself about what, uh, what goods are available in your community and how people can go and get those goods, whether it's online, whether it's in local stores. Um, you know, something I always like to talk about are some of the most common goods that people might not think about uh, if they're not aware of fair trade before, um, that conversation you're having with them, you know, coffee, bananas, uh, chocolate, for instance. Um, and I do also like to try to talk about other lifestyle choices like clothing. Um, and just in general, you know, apparel and jewelry and such, because I think we tend to really think about um, items that are ethically made or fair trade in, in kind of these, these nice boxes, um, but not think about how across our lives we can really make changes systematically if we really commit. Um, so as you can tell, I'm very passionate about all of this and uh, I really hope that 
um, you know, to hear from you all about your ideas, um, how we can really bring together more the anti-trafficking movement as well as fair trade and ethically made goods. I mean, if I, if I had a wish, um, to be honest, as a, as a person and a consumer in this movement as well, I wish that it was simpler to buy a fair trade. Um, I wish it was simpler to buy ethically made. And I think that future is coming. I have a lot of hope, just as much as I have hope that human trafficking will end someday uh, with everyone's actions and, and commitment. I also hope that it will be easier to buy ethically made goods to the point that perhaps someday we won't need a label to have to identify all of our goods because goods will be made fairly. Um, but until then, uh, I think we all have to take a stand and really educate ourselves, not just one to have the knowledge, but to be able to speak effectively and clearly to continue to com communicate and promote um, the, these ideas so that people take these ideas and make them a reality. So, gosh, um, I'm trying to think if there's anything else I should talk about, but in essence, I just really wanted to communicate really the messaging around that. Um, just to share a little bit about what we've done as Fair Trade Houston, um, you know, we've been able to host a regular events on an annual biannual basis. Uh, one of them is the market I just mentioned. We've also conducted film screenings. Um, one year, when near the, towards the beginning, we actually conducted a scavenger hunt to identify fair trade items. So it's about just really kind of these cute like events to get people engaged and um, committed um, to even sign like commitment cards and such. Um, so while these ideas, they might not necessarily generate large crowds and such, but I think it helps to build that foundation for a strong movement. Um, because when we started this work years ago, you know, there would maybe be a handful of people who knew about fair trade or, you know, knew where to go get goods. But um, that number is increasing. Um, and there's also, along with that, you know, that period of time that's passed, we have so many more choices. So I think it's a very exciting time to be engaged in the movement. Um, and a very opportune time as more and more companies are waking up to the fact that consumers care, um, but they're not going to care unless people like ourselves are out there helping to advance these ideas and promote them. All right, I'll get off my soapbox so that Patrick can share. And then if anyone has any questions, I'm happy to um, answer and chat uh, throughout our time this evening and beyond. Thanks, Lisa. Thanks so much for elaborating on that. And yeah, I definitely agree with you that fair trade is an awesome solution for human trafficking. Um, and people undervalue their dollar and the effects that it can have in, you know, your life uh, <clears throat> issues, especially when trying to combat human trafficking, especially when they're having a hard time in finding it, uh, finding other outlets to, you know, help out with those issues. So next, we're going to move on to Patrick just to continue the call. And Patrick is the founder of See It and It Film Festival. And Patrick, would you be able to elaborate more on who you are, uh, what your role is on the uh, See It and It Film Festival, and how, uh, sorry, what the issues of human trafficking mean to you before you start your segment? Um, yeah, and just thank you very much for having this, by the way, and, and uh, allowing us to connect. Um, the, the passion of my heart is collaboration on ending things since, and especially human trafficking. So I'm really grateful for this. Um, so my, my start is I worked with the United Nations Refugee Agency and I was introduced to human trafficking through organ, organ harvesting of children escaping southern Sudan. And, uh, and that just kind of tore my heart up. And then I learned more about kind of labor trafficking. And then that led to kind of the domestic sex trafficking all around us here in Los Angeles. Um, so I started working with the Long Beach Human Trafficking Task Force, uh, which is a real collaboration of community members, NGOs, um, resource organizations, law enforcement, um, legislators. Um, so it's a, it's a very dynamic kind of task force in Long Beach. Um, I led the prevention side of things, and that's really where my heart lies, is, is really going to prevention. Um, so looking at prevention, for me, it was going upstream and seeing where vulnerabilities are being created and where um, the, the heart to exploit and the, the heart to, to, to become traffickers or to become customers, where, where is this coming from? So I started two years ago, we started holding a, a father conference um, dealing with the issue of missing fathers and abusive fathers and, and distracted fathers that has led to a lot of the things that allow people to be exploited or, or to become exploiters. Um, and then the next thing I started was the uh, See It Ended Film and Arts Festival. 
So it's, it's beyond just a film festival, but it includes all of the arts. And, and the intention is really how do we get culture to change its narrative, to, to start to look at human trafficking as a, as a, as a crime against humanity, as something that's causing us all to be diminished. And, and how do we all get on board with stopping it? So for me, everything is like, how do, we, how do we engage people? How do we expose people to the reality, to the, to the horror of human trafficking, but hand in hand with ways that they can actually substantially help to end it? So through, sorry about the noise. Uh, so through the film festival, especially, so in organizing this, it, it's a very large project. We had, the first one was last year, we had 19 films. Um, we had music, dance, spoken word. It, it really kind of drew together the human trafficking community. And then it made it so that people who will not attend a conference could come to watch a film or could come to something that was a little bit more entertainment centered and then get educated. And after every film, after every, after every block of films, we had um, a panel of, of either the, fil the filmmakers, we had survivors, we had uh, people who are working in other countries in the field, um, experts, various aspects of fighting human trafficking, like on a panel. And then that became a question and answer period with the audience. Um, and that was probably the most dynamic thing. The, the films just kind of open your heart, but then it's after that is really getting the nuance and getting the, the you know, the backstory and the, and the a little bit more in the gritty side of what's happening with human trafficking, whether it's labor or, or sex trafficking. Um, so through the, through the panel discussion, we really engage people. And what happened is they walked straight out of the film, out of the theater and into the lobby where we had, uh, you know, organizations, we had fair trade, we had um, sex trafficking, we had all different organizations that were there and then people could just go and sign right up or engage with some action steps to end it. And that's the, that's the purpose. So the, what we're trying to do is really create an environment where people feel an urgency and feel that, that a need, but also feel that no matter what you are or who you are, you can contribute to ending human trafficking. And so that's the whole intention of the, of the film and art festival. So the next one is coming up. It's going to be in April, April 3rd and 4th. Um, we're holding it for the second year in the same location. It's a, it's a 1930s historic theater um, in San Pedro, which is a kind of the south side of Los Angeles. Um, so we'll be, we'll be drawing from filmmakers, musicians, artists of all kinds. We had, we had about 30 artists sent, sent paintings from South America that were related to human trafficking. Um, so it's really kind of, how do we draw the whole community together? And then how do we reach out to bring people who are just becoming aware or aren't aware at all of human trafficking, give them, give them some education, some information, and then you know, just step right into being able to take some action steps. So this is, this is the, the goal of, of uh, See It End It. And the idea there is that, you know, again, we hear this all the time, but it's like without awareness, nothing's going to get changed. But awareness itself isn't going to be enough. So we can't just show a movie and then have people go home and feel like it's enough to wish that they could kill pimps. It's, we have to give them a process. We have to give them something that they can actually do. So I think at this point, we have about 10 fair trade organizations that will be, that will have tables there. Um, we, all together, I think we're going to have about 40 um, 40 resource tables, organizations, vendors, kind of at the event. Um, I think also the, the thing that we've been able to do through the film festival is really draw from legislators um, as well as law enforcement, but then also survivors and kind of just, just everyday citizens. We have this, the soccer mom who hears something and really wants to do something. Um, with fair trade, I think California's California's really led the way in a lot of a lot of respects. That there that there's legislation um, dealing with companies who who sell within the state of California that they have to guarantee kind of the 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 the, the chain of their products that that they're free of slavery. Um, so California has done a number of things legislatively. Um, but again, it's like legislation. We're not going to legislate our way, way out of this problem and out of this horror. Um, it really is going to take cutting off the demand as well. And that's where fair trade, educating people about fair trade goods, that they can actually do something, do, do twice as much with their, with their money. They can not only get something that they need, but they can also be fighting trafficking at the same time and, and enabling people to have a decent life. Um, and then also with sex trafficking, we, we have to educate 
um, kind of men and the whole attitudes of entitlement that lead to kind of the, the trafficking of girls and boys and, and people becoming customers of 11 year old autistic children, which is absolutely horrifying. Um, so this is kind of like where my, my heart lies is really in how do we collaborate? How do we draw, draw together and, and create a, a step-by-step way for people to engage with this issue in a way that's not debilitating. It's not so heavy that they just want to go home and stick their head under a pillow, but that they actually, you know, feel inspired that they're doing something. And, and one thing I would just say the, the last film festival we had, we had about 800 people attend, which was, which was pretty good for a first festival. Um, but we really wanted it. We, we got kind of attacked at first saying you shouldn't call this a festival. This is too dark. It's too heavy. But what we really wanted was to create an atmosphere where, you know, we're celebrating because together we're going to end this. So this is kind of, yeah, we're looking at something really dark and something really heavy, but we're ending it. And together we're going to end it. And there was such a, there was such a high feeling of, of all these different kinds of people coming together and feeling like they were on the same page of wanting to fight something really evil. And, uh, and that was just really inspiring. The, the comments that we got, it was people saying that they left happy <laughs> after, after watching some very heavy films. So anyway, I'm, I'm more than happy to have questions, but he has any. It's, it's, hey, Patrick, it's just, it's, hey. this is, right. it's a very difficult connection for people to make between fair trade and trafficking. And it took me a long time to figure that out. And I'm, I'm not stupid, I'm not smart, but I'm not stupid. So, you know, how do we get the generic person who just wants their brand new iPhone to realize that buying that iPhone is maybe contributing to trafficking? It's a, it, it's a, it's a, it's a difficult connection to make. I, I think it's, I mean, again, I mean, I, I believe that through the arts, we actually can begin to draw people in to engage with the, kind of with the issue. And so this time we'll have at least one or one or two fair trade or, or labor trafficking films. And, and so you, through through exposure to what's really happening when you can actually graphically see it i think what happens to a lot of people is you just try to describe you know kids are living this really poor existence and you shouldn't buy that chocolate right it doesn't work very well but right. if they can actually see how people are living if, if you can actually show people what's happening their hearts are much more moved and then they then it makes sense something clicks and that's why to me that's why the arts is really important and why why the film festival why why engage that, that aspect of culture that can really open people's hearts. Because I think we can make that link, but if you just try to you know, talk it through, I, I don't think it's as effective as if people can actually see something. Right. And this, this kind of in my experience. Is huge. I yeah. was gonna jump in too and respond, um, and also draw upon some things that Patrick said. I think we have to really break down like when we have someone's attention so whether that's talking about trafficking um you know when we go out and we present we typically we we are a unique agency uh, among many other anti-trafficking agencies locally and even nationally that we specialize in education we've been doing this a long time um but we also make sure that when we talk about trafficking in any kind of venue we talk about both sex and labor trafficking um and so yeah. Many times, most people have heard about sex trafficking more often than not uh, versus labor trafficking. Although that's, that's been changing in our experience. We do have more people who seem to hear about labor trafficking, but it's not nearly to the you know, wide recognition or numbers of sex trafficking. And so sure. when you can first kind of address it from that step. I mean, since we are you know, on a call talking about human trafficking and, and human trafficking awareness month and such and linking that to fair trade, um, you know, you have to kind of start from that space that people are typically coming to us because they're interested in human trafficking. And so we can, we, when we can define that, um, then we can talk about solutions. Like, here's the problem. Now here's what you can do. 
And I love that Patrick mentioned demand. That's something I actually didn't talk about, but that's actually my primary role at the agency is to work on strategic initiatives. And demand is one of those things that, I mean, I shouldn't say thing like it's just not something important, but it's actually one of the more cutting edge um, trends to say, so to say, uh, in the anti-trafficking movement where more and more people are now Um, we've come through and we recognize trafficking. We understand that it's a problem. And then now I think from here to the next maybe two years or so, we're going to really see a huge surge in a lot more people asking questions about how do you stem the demand for trafficking? Um, Because there's a popular theory of thought that human trafficking is supply and demand based. And so if we address the demand, then the supply will lower. Um, And so with sex trafficking, there are quite a few more advanced tactics than combating labor trafficking. Um, I think, Patrick, you mentioned some of them. Um, We are in the process of trying to bring an innovative program for uh, males, focused more towards males and buyers of sex trafficking um, that, or, well, sex trafficking and or prostitution, and um, really bringing the education piece so they understand more about, you know, gender-based violence and and equality, Um, What are some of the ideas and uh, methods that these people bought into that allowed them to make that choice to purchase another human being for sex? Mm -hmm. Um, So that's something that we're working on uh, very much in the next few months. Um, And there aren't a lot of programs out there. I mean, we've been doing research. I've been doing research for the past year. And even beyond that, we were actively engaged in local movements to try to address um, more demand-based tactics to combat human trafficking. Um, So that's sex trafficking. But with labor trafficking, being that it's lesser known, we have to break down that stereotype, break down that barrier of what is labor trafficking. And one of the things that I like to do, again, to like make it as simple and clear as concise as possible when talking to people about human trafficking and, and trying to advance labor trafficking or awareness of it, is to make people understand that labor trafficking happens to anyone. Any situation where someone can work can be a situation for exploitation. That's literally how I will say it um, into, you know, any kind of audience, Um, no matter if I'm training law enforcement or I'm talking to a group of college students like I was today. Um, And so helping people hopefully to understand that it's, it's not, human trafficking is not just sex trafficking, it's also labor trafficking. And when we talk about where that labor trafficking happens, that's where we can, that I feel like that's where you can bring in the link to fair trade and exploitation. Because if we're angry about, human trafficking, first of all, and labor trafficking now, hopefully, um, that, you know, people are abusing other people to produce our goods or to produce a good as good or service that we might use, then it then becomes easier to say, well, here's what you can do. Here's a positive change that you can do. Um, one of the things I also like to say in those kinds of settings is that um, I like to kind of add like rhetorical questions or such. So I'll be like, hey, you know, not many of us are out there on the street buying sex. So you might be wondering, hmm, how am I part of the problem? Well, the fact of the matter is we are all part of this problem, whether we want to or want to be or not. And so then it invites the conversation around how, well, okay, how am I involved in, in, in slavery and promoting human trafficking? I, I don't want to be a part of that. And so that allows you to start to talk about, well, there is exploitation, there is slavery in our supply lines and products. And I think someone asked a question about that in the chat about training UPS drivers and such. So I'm hoping to address some of that with this response. Um, but in a sense, yeah, it's about kind of shedding, opening people's eyes and awareness to one, that human trafficking is diverse and complex, but two, that this is a changeable solution that more commonly, I think we, we tend to, like, like I was saying earlier, think in silos that, okay, these are, these are solutions to address sex trafficking and these are solutions to address labor trafficking. Um, but when we talk about fair trade, we tend to, I mean, at least, at least I know we do, and I do it myself, like try to present it as a solution to, to combat labor trafficking. But the reality is that something like fair trade can actually um, prevent and, and, and eliminate all forms of human trafficking. So I think it makes it even more powerful and compelling of an argument to put forth to anyone who wants to be an abolitionist, who wants to fight slavery. Like, here's what you can do. Buying a cup of coffee helps this farmer to, you know, support their families and the premiums on fair trade help to go directly back into the community and building schools and water sources and hospitals. And, you know, I'm preaching to the choir, but, um, but yes, yeah, so you have that as well. Um, if I can, Lexi, do you want me to um, address more, more in terms of that question about the UPS driver? 
Um, so right now, what I would think would be best if we can get to the last speaker, and then afterwards, we'll be able to jump into all of that, just so she has enough time to go over. But thanks so much for you guys for elaborating on that and answering those questions. Um, but again, let's jump into uh, Marissa. So just a quick intro on Marissa. When Marissa discovered uh, human trafficking about a decade ago, it was a fire that lit inside of her to do something about it. But like so many other people, she didn't feel qualified and didn't know where to start. Today with Dress Ember, Marissa spends her days equipping, equipping others to use their voice to make an impact in the fight against human trafficking. Marissa is the Director of Partnership at Dress Ember, a nonprofit that involves people around the world to use their voice and style choices to advocate for those to, uh, for the inherent dignity of all people. Though these small consistent actions uh, so I see these small consistent actions, over 25,000 people have in, participated in cell challenges and raised approximately 10 million to fund anti-trafficking work around the world. Marissa considers it a privilege and a dream job to empower people to change the world through their individuality, creativity. And so Marissa, I'm gonna go ahead and hand it over to you and please share with us um, about you and your, your uh, sorry, adventure, sorry, the uh, human trafficking issues. Hi everyone, um, thanks for having me. So I'm Marissa, the Director of Partnerships for Dress Ember. And um, I just realized my bio was a bit of a mouthful, so I'm gonna try to break it down a little bit more for you guys. Um, so what Dress Ember is, is we are an annual style challenge in the month of December. Uh, many people are familiar with Movember, um, which is where men grow um, a mustache to raise money for, um, it started out with, well, they brought in it to just overall men's health. Um, dress number is very similar, but men and women around the world put on dresses and ties in the month of December to raise money for anti-trafficking. So we just finished our um, seventh Dress Ember December campaign, which goes into January, and we've raised about $10 million um, to fund anti-trafficking work around, that, around the world. So how this works is, and I love the conversations that have already been had um, on this call because there's such um, a spotlight on the awareness piece of trafficking, and that's kind of where Dress Ember comes in. And with awareness, and um, equally as important is action, and really, giving something to someone something to do about this, right? So oftentimes people find out about trafficking and they're gutted and they don't know what to do about it and they don't necessarily, you know, if you're a college student, you don't have money to donate. If you're not in law school, you're not gonna, you know, change policy on human trafficking. So um, really where Dress Ember comes in is there's, a lot of young people involved, a lot of college students, um, they want to do something about this. And they have networks and they have a voice um, to make a difference. And that's where Dress Ember empowers them. So how it works is people start fundraising pages on Dress Ember's website. It's like a social media profile. And say why they're passionate about this and what they're doing to stop it. Um, and by, you know, this silly kind of quirky style challenge in the month of December really is a sacrifice that someone is making, um, going out of their comfort zone a bit to um, use their voice and their, their style choices to make a difference. And um, we had about 6,500 people around the world last year participate, um, last December in about 45 different countries. So it's really, this campaign has become a movement that has spread and we've seen, um, you know, people as young as 17 years old raising $25,000 for anti-trafficking work. Um, so we're, we're a campaign, what we do best is raise money and then that money is then translated into tangible impact through our partners. So we partner with 15 organizations around the world. Um, working, the thing about human trafficking I won't go into too much detail, but as a lot of you know here, it's very complex. It's been mentioned, um, and there isn't one program that's going to end it. It's going to take a lot of collaboration, um, a lot of different organizations focusing on prevention and aftercare and all sorts of things. So Dress Ember comes in and um, supports those programs. And it's a really range diverse set of programs that we support. Um, 
especially well here in California, there's a massive link between the foster care system and human trafficking. Um, we, California is the top state for, we have the most foster kids in the nation. So um, there's an issue with youth transitioning out of the foster care system when they hit 18 and they're very vulnerable and being trafficked. Um, so one of the programs that we work on is um, educating youth about the risk of trafficking. And as I was reading the questions in the comment box, um, I saw training got brought up, which again goes back to this awareness piece, right? So um, we work on a lot of trainings with one of our partners um, to train hospitality staff, particularly in the hotel industry, how to spot trafficking. Um, we just launched a massive partnership with Lyft the ride sharing company in preparation for the Super Bowl um, to train their drivers on human trafficking. So really trying to target it at all these angles. But again, I just want to highlight um, this awareness piece that keeps coming up, right? And this like people have to be aware that it's actually happening. Um, and then something else really unique about Dressember is our obvious link between um, human trafficking and fashion. So a lot of, you know, Dress Ember is mostly women around the world that participate and um, we talk a lot about ethical fashion and um, being a conscious consumer and paying attention to where your clothes are coming from. And as someone mentioned, the apparel and jewelry industry is, um, is really key in breaking down the, the trafficking in the fashion industry. Um, I mean, even here in LA, there's issues in the garment district with trafficking. So no city is exempt. Um, and so really at December we try, we have the, this audience of people that want to learn about human trafficking and that are consuming and consuming and consuming. Um, so we try to use our platform and our blog to make this connection between trafficking and, um, and fashion. I just, oh, oh, that's great. Sorry, I'm just reading this this comment um yeah i know the film festival is also here in in california so yeah we'll get back to that um but yeah we try to focus so much on the fashion industry we of course dress Ember, we had to start a dress collection it was only natural um so we also produce an annual dress collection of uh survivor made dresses and we get a lot of people that write in asking us you know where to shop um we try to avoid fa any fast fashion so we have a we created this last year an ethical fashion directory where people can go in and um, it's sorted by category and make sure that these brands are um, following labor standards and there's no trafficking going on in their supply chain. Um, yeah, so that is Dress Ember. We do a few other things throughout the year, but our main focus is the campaign, the month of December. That's when 95% of our fundraising comes in. Um, and yeah, we're wrapping up our campaign in the next few days and how to have a big goal of hitting two and a half million dollars and we're just a few hundred shy from it. So um, that's really exciting and just seeing the impact that is created by so many people that care. Um, I think this was mentioned too, like people really do want to see this end and if you give them something, if you give them an action where they, if they can take action, they will contribute. Um, so I think it's just really special to see, especially so many young people in this movement, college students that um, are making an impact and they're the ones now educating their parents and grandparents about trafficking and about the link between fair trade and trafficking. Um, so yeah, I think that's all for me. I know we probably want to get to the questions. Yes, thank you so much, Marissa. That's such a cool and like creative outlet for people to kind of get involved in. And now that I know about it, I'm definitely going to be participating. And again, thank you so much to all of our other speakers for sharing uh, about these resources that people can get involved in, whether it's in your region or, you know, <laughs> worldwide. And so now that we have some time left, I would love to get into questions. So we'll take them one by one, or if you want to drop them into the comments, and then um, speakers, as you guys feel free, you guys can um, address and elaborate on them. So do we have any questions? 
Yeah, this is Teresa with Fair Trade Long Beach, and uh, I'm happy to have Patrick on board with the See It Ended yeah. Film Festival. Someone asked Thank me you. if uh, you were going to have Fair Trade vendors at the film festival. Yeah, we have um, ten that we're going to have. Yeah, and then I'll just elaborate that last year that you showed Chocolate's Child Slaves as one of the documentaries on fair trade, and we also highlighted the exploitation and slavery that goes on in Thailand. So. I'm thrilled that you bring that angle into the film festival. Thank you so much. Yeah, we really want to expand that too. So this time, I really want to jump on to, to what Marissa just said too about foster care, um, kind of spinning off of that because this time we're kind of the center part of Saturday is going to be on foster care. Um, so we have kids in the spotlight films uh, that were made by, written by foster youth and realizing that that's really a pipeline um, for, for a lot of kids to get exploited. I mean, I think we have foster youth getting exploited in labor, kind of labor situations, um, as well as in sex trafficking. So anybody who's got anything, any ideas that they can kind of throw in so we can, we can make this the most effective kind of introduction to foster care also would be uh, a part of the film festival. Thank you, Teresa. Are there any other questions or would you guys like to elaborate on anything else, speaker? And for the folks that are on the phone or on video, remember you're on mute. So remember to unmute yourself. We can hear you. Hey, Pat. This is just very briefly for Patrick. There's, a, there's an Ashton Kutcher testimony before Congress where he starts talking about foster youth. And just in a matter of two or three minutes, he makes a very strong statement about trafficking and foster kids. So I'll have to send you that link. And somewhere we can work that in. It's only like a two or three minute clip that would be worth watching. You've yeah, I've seen, seen it. it. I've seen it, yeah. And actually, we have some feelers out. We're trying to get Ashton Kircher and his wife to come to the film festival. Right. And also related to human trafficking for sporting events, I know Formula One has, I'm going to, I'm going to send the link in the chat area. Formula One has a specific anti-modern slavery act um, policy. And I know last year at the Super Bowl, which is coming up this Sunday, there were a number of advertisements made by stars about human trafficking because that's such an event. And I, I, I sure hope that is resonating with some of the common sports fans about sex workers, you know, traveling a circuit to go to the Super Bowl, the All-Star Games, the Stanley Cup Finals, the, you know, World Cup, that I, I don't know how to, how to make people think about wait a minute, if I'm going with this man or woman to have sex, they maybe don't really want to be here. And it's not survival sex, it's a trafficking sex situation. So I'm just tossing that out there and now I'll, if I know how to mute myself, I'll mute myself. <laughs> Well, I think Marissa mentioned it. Um, I can definitely take a stab at responding to that, Ray. Thanks for bringing it up. Um, I was able to work and headline a lot of, or spearhead, I should say, um, a lot of the projects that were, uh, that our agency was involved in in combating uh, human trafficking and awareness around the Super Bowl when it was held, I think, I think it was Super Bowl 51 that was held in Houston in 2017. Um, we did our due diligence about a year, year and a half prior to the Super Bowl happening in Houston to research just past Super Bowls, what methods people have used, and uh, actually go and visit the Bay Area because they were hosting it the year prior to us. 
Um, and what we found is that um, there had been, it sounds like along the lines and even more so today, there's been this growing interest and awareness. I guess that's the theme of today's talk uh, or call that human trafficking is something that can happen. Um, the reality is that the actual numbers of stats of arrests as well as recovery or um, victims recovered is, it varies. Um, in our experience, I don't remember the exact numbers, uh, but it definitely did not live up to our expectations of making a lot of arrests and recovering a lot of victims. Um, but even so, we were still glad that we prepared. We were glad that we spent the time in investing and holding several awareness events in months prior, um, utilizing January as, you know, naturally being Human Trafficking Awareness Month or well, we call it HTM, we call it Human Trafficking Awareness Month in Houston, but nationally it's National Slavery and Human Trafficking Prevention Month. Um, we utilize that opportunity to hope, uh, to hope to drive up more interest. Um, and if people are on the call aren't aware, um, the idea is that large events like the Super Bowl can be a draw, essentially, that traffickers, particularly sex traffickers, will bring their victims to a location where they know there will be a lot of clients or customers wanting to purchase sex. Um, so that's the, the idea there. Um, and we've, but we've also seen more anecdotal data on the other side of things in the form of comments and stories of people in sex work who do travel to these places um, because they know that they will have clients. Um, you know, so it's, it's honestly still, I think, too, too little is known um, in terms of definitive hard facts and numbers of uh, does trafficking actually increase around large events like the Super Bowl or um, you know, we've had evidence, say, in the World Cup that labor trafficking has actually been present and evident in building some of these stadiums. Um, but sex trafficking, again, tends to get a larger amount of awareness and support. But regardless of the actual statistics, uh, we believe as an agency that it's important to utilize any opportunity, um, because trafficking happens every day, uh, to raise awareness about human trafficking. So training hospitality, um, I'd love to talk to Marissa about that um, partnership with Lyft. That is awesome. Um, I know when we were here, we were trying to train hospitality up and we've been in talks. Uh, we were able to partner with a large taxi company in Houston um, called the Yellow Cab to uh, send out text alerts and information uh, periodically around the Super Bowl as well as other major events that are held in Houston. And that's been, I think, ongoing since. Um, so, you know, mobilizing in different ways, I think, is again, just taking, taking that opportunity to spread more awareness about trafficking and um, provide action to people who want to take action. Right. I think a lot of the Super Bowl uh, publicity was more toward the people in the host city and the police agencies in the host mm -hmm. city, ah, yes. as opposed to the generic person who's coming there to party and right. wants to have a good time on a Friday night before the game. Yeah. I should probably clarify that in Houston. How do we reach have... that person? Yeah, in Houston, we have had a long-standing human trafficking awareness movement. And so when we looked at um, other cities, it was definitely a situation where there might not be a lot of awareness. Like I believe in Minnesota, which hosted a Super Bowl a year after us, they didn't have as much awareness and organization. Um, when we looked at the Bay Area, who hosted Super Bowl 50, they utilized it as an opportunity to organize around human trafficking period. So I should have... Yeah, thanks for mentioning that. I should have put, put the context forward that, yeah, we were, we were trying to reach the general public, but um, I'm hopeful that, you know, more and more having this conversation that there will be other efforts and particularly, I mean, we'd love to hear from the NFL uh, to, to address these things, but, you know, they, they've also got other issues to address as well. Thanks, Mason. I'm on. <laughs> Um, and just on that point too, um, Saving Innocence is beginning to start discussions with the Rams and with the Chargers here locally to kind of get them as teams to get them involved in fighting human trafficking. Um, the same way that the Angels through the strikeout slavery campaign is kind of like reached into baseball. We need to get, we need to get basketball and football on board and then ice hockey and then soccer. And yeah, I think, I wanna say I heard that, I forget, I'm forgetting, I feel like I heard this in the last month or two that there's a sport, someone's trying to work with a sport and a league to get the players to wear blue, which is the, I believe somewhat unofficial color because there isn't official color for human trafficking, right. but blue has been a long time considered the unofficial official color <laughs> of trafficking. Um, so kind of like how people wear pink during Breast Cancer Awareness Month, um, I believe the idea is trying to get athletes to wear blue. 
Um, so if anyone knows any more information about that, please feel free to share. Yeah, well, there's an annual campaign in January. Well, there's Wear Blue Day, which people do yes. on Human Trafficking Awareness Day. Also, um, International Justice Mission, they have a group of athletes and a lot of football players, too, um, called Team Freedom that they're working with um, to talk about human trafficking and use their platform. Um, so I think that's a step in the right direction. Yeah, it's so awesome how people from like different platforms are getting involved and raising awareness, um, especially when it's like adding to the cause and they have such a huge audience. And just, uh, you know, because we're getting close to the five o'clock mark, I want to thank everybody for coming. I want to thank our speakers for sharing and for again providing resources to all the people who attended on how they can get involved in, um, in abolishing and stopping human trafficking in their area and globally. And before we go ahead and end the call, I would like to hand it back over to Kylie so she can explain about our uh, fair trade conference that's coming up and the activities we'll have for Valentine's Day as well. Wonderful. Thank you, Alexis. And just to echo, thank you everyone for joining. This has been a really great discussion. Um, I won't um, keep everyone too long before I turn it over to Alexis to close, but just to say that we do have our 2020 National Conference coming up here in March in Pasadena, and we're really excited to be gathering close to 500 uh, fair trade advocates, brands, organizations, producers themselves from across the country um, in Southern California. Everyone on this call, in addition to the recording, will get information about the conference. Um, and of course, um, human trafficking is an issue that is so important for our network. Um, look at the engagement on this call, the fact that we had so many folks interested in joining. So we're scoping a few different um, pieces that we'll touch on human trafficking at the conference. Um, we might be doing a film series. We're trying to work out the logistics for that one of the evenings. So um, please do spread the word about the conference as much as you can. Uh, we hope to get a really great turnout joining us in just six weeks here. So it's coming up soon. Um, and then last but not least, Valentine's Day is in just two weeks. We have a really neat program this year where we're actually partnering with Alter Eco, a fair trade chocolate brand to deliver in person Valentine's to cocoa farmers in Ecuador. So anyone can join anyone can participate with your school with your office your family friends um, everyone on this call will get the blog post that has all the info about the campaign and the valentine's template you can write them and then send them to me at the oakland office and we'll actually deliver them to uh, cocoa farmers in ecuador through um, alter eco so we're really trying to raise awareness around um, cocoa and of course how um, prevalent child labor is in conventional cocoa so there's some fact sheets in there as well that you can utilize. So hope everyone will join us for that too. Back to you, Alexis. Alexa, Lexi, this is Joan Harper. If I can have 30 seconds. Um, LA hopes uh, two days before the conference to be declared uh, fair trade, a fair trade town. Sorry, Houston, we, we, will, uh, we will nudge you out of the way a little <laughs> bit. But um, and I, we've had a very long campaign too, so I appreciate what you've gone through. Um, and uh, with a press conference and all of that, I think it's scheduled for the 18th of March, but um, we'll really be doing a, a victory dance at the, at the conference and, and hopefully that will be encouragement to people that are thinking about starting a campaign or lagging campaigns or whatever, that, that it, it's all possible. You just kind of keep, keep at it. So um, anyway, we're excited about that. But um, the other part, and San Pedro, I know, Patrick, you mentioned, um, we need organizations or businesses that don't sell fair trade products uh, to serve one fair trade item in the city of LA. And we're, we're only halfway there. That's a real stumbling block because it's just hard. So if any of you cross paths with a, you know, a congregation, your spa, your, uh, again, somebody that would, might sell something, a business, an insurance company, you know, whatever that might serve a fair trade item within the city of LA, we really need to know that. So you could go to the Fair Trade LA website. You can do Fair Trade LA at Gmail. That's Alicia's Gmail account. So um, we really would. We need more more arms and legs and outreach. So thank you. Thanks for that, Joan. And this is Kylie. We can definitely get that out to the Southwest Network as well through some other ways. So we'll circle up on that. It's so exciting. Congratulations. Yes, congratulations and thanks for sharing, Joan. Again, thank you so much to our speakers for joining us, for sharing. Thanks to everybody who jumped in on this call. I hope you guys all learned something and we're, are going to have some awesome takeaways and be able to actually go out and get involved in your communities and helping to end 
a human trafficking. Again, we love to see you guys all at the conference and I hope you guys all have a wonderful day continuing. And yes, thank you for joining and I'll talk to you guys all soon. All Thanks right, a lot, bye. Jeff. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you everyone. Great hour. Thanks bye. everybody. <laughs>